in any ways, we naturally, I mean, in Japan, tend to think that in either ways, whichever wins, we need to strengthen our own defense capabilities and also our uh, uh, deterrence as well. And at the same time, uh, uh, well, we have some quite nationalistic reasons why we think that uh, we need to have much stronger technologies, advanced technologies, like in Germany, I suppose. And in many ways, the United States is not just our partner, but the competitor as well in uh, developing our own technologies. So we have to do both ways. But in the meantime, what does that mean for Japan's foreign policy? I mean, right now, as we are speaking, the Americans are voting and we still don't know who will be president. But whoever it will be, I mean, the pressure on Japan to to be part of the Indo-Pacific strategy of the US will be quite large. So what do you expect? What can this or what will this instable Japanese uh, cabinet, ca what can it produce in terms of foreign policy strategy? Or is the foreign policy strategy set already anyhow by the ministries and by the bureaucratic apparatus? And will, will it just keep running the way it's running? Or do you expect changes to happen? I mean, well, internal, not externally yes, induced. Yes. Thank you very much. That's quite important question. And number one, uh, in the last few years, when I attend conferences overseas, I was often told that Japan has been a quite important stabilizer among liberal democracies, like the United States, now in Canada as well, and also France as well, uh, because of the loss of the general re-election in July, and Germany as well. Uh, Prime Minister Scholz, Chancellor Scholz faced so many problems both from within and then from outside. So uh, among the G7 member states, many liberal democracies are facing difficulties in governing uh, their own people. Like uh, by priority, we are seeing the rise of both quite populistic uh, extreme, extreme right party and extreme left wing party. Well, as we can see in Germany, particularly, and uh, also, uh, so the lies of populism, lies of nationalism, and the bipolarity, particularly in the U.S. politics. Uh, well, whichever wins, uh, we continue to see the bipolarity, uh, bipolar nature of uh, American politics. So it would seriously damage, undoubtedly, American global leadership. So in the last few years, in place of some of these countries, I think that Japan... Uh, brought some sort of stability in the G7 solidarity. And uh, at the same time, I also feel that Japan could bring some sort of wisdom uh, to uh, create a, the way ahead uh, in the current quite turbulent uh, international politics. So I think that the uh, that that the decline of the stability in or the end of ja the stability in Japanese politics have a huge repercussion upon the future direction of liberal democracies or the G7. Because next year, the G7 summit will be held in Canada. And uh, it is quite likely that, uh, well, uh, well, we don't know yet whether Donald Trump can win the presidential election, but the whichever wins, it is quite likely that upper house, lower house, more or less, will be occupied by many uh, MAGA, I mean the Trumpian members of the house. So that if they are more influential, it means that uh, Canada will face a serious problem with uh, maintaining a good relationship with the United States. So uh, in the coming years, we will uh, continue to see the difficulties uh, in those uh, liberal democratic countries and uh, well, the decline of Japanese influence within the G7 or the within the liberal democracies will have a, I think, a huge impact upon the solidarity of those liberal, liberal democratic countries. Now, Japan within the G7, Japan is the only non-European North American 
exactly. member. At yeah. the same time, two weeks ago, we've just had the 16th BRICS summit, which was actually quite large. And we see this new group of countries emerge, not necessarily as a counterweight to the G7 or the West, but they are just building now an alternative structure. Is there any kind of, to your knowledge, or is there any interest in the Japanese political process among some actors to also start working with BRICS on whatever level it is, you know, or just approach it? Or is this something that's currently unthinkable for Japan? Well, the short answer to your question uh, is no, but uh, with some reservations. Number one, uh, last year, uh, uh, Japan played a really key role in breaching G7 and G20. Uh, India was the presidency of the G20 summit in Delhi. And India uh, uh, is uh, expanding its influence within the so-called global South countries. Hmm. Of course, uh, India is a member state of a uh, member of the BRICS as well, as well as uh, like uh, 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 Shang Shanghai Cooperation Organization Council and so on. So in this way, uh, India is influential and Japan maintains its good relationship with India. Uh, uh, but uh, the gap between G7 and G20 is widening, like India, Brazil, South Africa, and so on. They are more critical to the United States uh, and some other European countries as well. And uh, so uh, they are showing, uh, presenting a quite different kind of international identity uh, towards the United States or liberal democracies. So in this way, we cannot, I mean, the G7 can no more uh, uh, occupy legitimacy or power within the international community and many Japanese leaders actually know it. So in this way, we cannot simply exclude or antagonize the BRICS because like China is an influential country and India is also an influential country, or uh, even they are more influential than before. So uh, that's why Japan uh, 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 supported to create uh, ALSEP with China. It's a kind of a free trade agreement, uh, Japan's free trade agreement with both China and the uh, are okay, um, are Republic of Korea. So uh, in the last several years, Japan has been pre presenting a quite inclusive uh, vision for the regional order, like a free and open in the Pacific vision. So this inclusive vision of international order, Japan's inclusive vision of in regional order is somewhat different from American, much more confrontational uh, vision for the regional order, particularly towards both Russia and China. Yes, please. So uh, this is very interesting. And I think this is a very important nuance that is often lost in in a lot of in a lot of discussions, because often Japan is looked at as the Germany of the East, and it's just an annex attached to the United States. And that while, yes, Japan is a security partner of the US and is a strong ally with bases everywhere. So security wise, really married to the United States. At the same time, politically, Japan doesn't always follow um, everything, right? And Japan often has has policies that on the outside look as if though they are completely compatible with the US strategy, but internally they it does something slightly different. So do you think that politically speaking, the pressure on Japan is now going to lead to something like a form of like having to act a little bit more neutral? Uh, in in the way that it that Japan approaches these different partners, because also the United States is um, expected to put more pressure on Japan, which is historically something that Japan also doesn't doesn't appreciate very much when it happens, especially in case Donald Trump won. Um, what are your expectations in terms of Japan's international positioning, and do you think it will try to to be more of a bridge? Than a, than a bridge head for um, for uh, certain interests on one or the other side. Well, exactly. And this is an important question, and it relates to, I suppose, your own research topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, the neutrality, because uh, there are several similar concepts relating to that, like a neutrality and also non-alignment and also strategic autonomy. Like a Japanese uh, economic security strategy has been based on the concept of strategic autonomy. So in this way, a Japanese economic security policy 
uh, should be a slightly different from American approach to that by creating a kind of a space for strategic autonomy. Like uh, ALTEP, uh, Japan created, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, free trade area with China. Of course, this is quite limited free trade area agreement. But uh, on the other hand, at the same time, Japan created a CPTPP, I mean, a free trade area in the Indo-Pacific region without the United States. Abe let to create it. And also Japan created the uh, EU-Japan uh, EPA Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, of course, without the United States, naturally. So Japan has been creating many, many free trade agreements without the United States, because the United States has been presenting a quite uh, unilateralist trade policy. And uh, we continue to see it, particularly if Donald Trump wins. So this, in this way, Japan has no strong incentive to follow such American practice, trade practices, distancing slightly from that American position while maintaining a good trade relationship. So in this way, I would say that the Japanese foreign policy is much more different from the United States foreign policy, uh, 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 even though we usually uh, tend to think that Japan is just following American path. And when we talk about security policy, my impression of the Japanese um, environment, like especially among security uh, policy experts who are also influential, like yourself, with with um, with like uh, advising politicians, that my observation is that there's two schools of thought. One that says we need to have more weapons and be more capable to support the United States more. And one that says we need more capabilities in order to, in case of emergency, go it alone, right? Uh, more strategic autonomy uh, in case uh, the U.S. security umbrella closed down. And I don't see these two schools as opposing each other, more as running in parallel. Is is that an impression that you would share or do you see the, the, the mindset here differently? Yeah, I I uh, agree with your assessment. And uh, at the same time, in addition to this, in addition to seeing a kind of a parallel approach of the two schools, in addition to that, the schools are sometimes mixed each other. Like, uh, well, number one, we continue to see quite unpredictable and a quite, quite a fluctuating American foreign policy. And we cannot predict the future American foreign policy course. So if uh, the United States borders will, will soon become much more inward looking, much, will become much more America first, we have to be more independent. But at the same time, the reason why the American borders are angry or at least frustrated would be that their uh, thinking or uh, Donald Trump is mentioning that American allies are too much rely upon American help. So in this way, in any ways, we naturally, I mean, in Japan tend to think that in either ways, whichever wins, we need to strengthen our own defense capabilities and also our uh, uh, deterrence as well. And at the same time, uh, uh, well, we have some quite nationalistic reasons why we think that uh, we need to have much stronger technologies, advanced technologies, like in Germany, I suppose. And in many ways, the United States is not just our partner, but the competitor as well in uh, developing our own technologies. So we have to do both ways to collaborate with the United States in a new uh, alignment of the supply chain, global supply chain. But at the same time, we uh, need to still think that America is a, our competitor in uh, developing a much stronger technology, car industries, and so on. So we have to do both ways to strengthen ourselves, but at the same time, we need to strengthen our, our partnership with, with the United States. Now, strengthening yourself comes always with the danger that from the outside, this will be perceived as an aggressive act, right? Especially by countries that might have historical memories like China to say like, oh, Japan is, is gearing up and it creates the security dilemma. But Mr. Ish Ishiba is an interesting character because he said, on the one hand, we need uh, more defense capabilities. On the other hand, we also need to continue, uh, uh, what's the word, um, um, 
the the strategic part not um a, a trust building um um yeah confidence and the conf uh, confidence uh, building confidence confidence building measures cbm confident right. building measures with china so do you think japan will try to reach out to china and also to to other you know us adversaries in order to signal that J japan is open for security dialogue and and trying to build a, 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 an understanding because i mean last year japan actually uh opened a high level um defense to defense ministry hotline with china right well light you're right but uh well uh well we need both i mean the we need both uh confidence building measures with china and we also need deterrence as well because mm. we cannot predict the future course of Chinese policy as well. We do not know whether China is willing to uh, use military force or not. So we have to prepare for the both cases. I mean, if China is not willing to use its military muscle, uh, we can be closer to China. But if China is ready for using its military muscle to expand its influence on the territories in the East China Sea, South China Sea, of course it did both in East China Sea and South China Sea previously. And we have good reason why uh, we believe that China is willing to use its military muscle to expand its influence on territories in the regions. But uh, coming back to your original question, now Chinese military budget is five times bigger than Japanese defense budget. So Japan is just a 20 percentage of Chinese defense budget. When we fought with the United States in 1941, we had a 70 percentage of military budget to the United, military power to the United States. So we are much weaker uh, uh, to China than to the United States in 1941. So uh, according to several military simulations, Chinese people, People's Liberation Army can win over Japanese self-defense forces within three or four days. So according to this, there is no good and uh, there is no reason for a Chinese military leaders who know this to be afraid of Japanese military power. Nowadays even ROK military budget is bigger than Japanese military budget. So they are confident. I mean the ROK government is much more confident uh, in, in its regard to the military power against Japan. So right. in this way, I don't think that, uh, okay, of course, there are still uh, existing discourses that uh, they have some reason to worry about Japanese future. But uh, if they are rational and pragmatic, they can be, I mean, the, both China and ROK can be much more arrogant towards Japan in having a stronger, in some way, a military power uh, in a different ways. I mean, both in China and Korea. Now, with the Republic of Korea, Japan has currently good working relationship, although some animosity remains. But North Korea is also still there. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I constantly have this feeling that Japan is actually more afraid of North Korea than of China, just because North Korea seems so unpredictable and has has such strong adversarial language, which which China actually doesn't 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 do. Is is that who is the the threat perception or the perception of like oh vulnerability is it higher from china or higher from north korea uh you're right until recently many in japan a security experts and practitioner seriously worried about taiwan contingency contingency but now we began to think uh, 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 uh that uh, north korean contingency would come earlier than taiwan contingency number one Russia is now supporting technologically, financially, politically, North Korean provocations. A decade ago, Russia joined in the sanction, United Nations Security Council sanction towards North Korea. So uh, Russia was with our side, at our side, uh, in sanctioning North Korea. But uh, in the end of April, uh, Russian government decided to dissolve the sanction panel of the United Nations Security Council towards North Korea. So now North Korea is freer in doing provocations or even military actions 
And it is quite probable that Russia would do not uh, actually uh, uh, support those sanctions towards North Korea. So Russia would veto uh, those sanctions towards uh, North Korea. So it is more likely that uh, North Korea can do, but it won't. So South Korean government is seriously worrying about that. And uh, to uh, uh, increase deterrence, North Korea, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Japan must collaborate much more closely with ROK because uh, in ROK, uh, basically, American for U.S. forces is mainly army, U.S. Army. And in Japan, American forces are mainly Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And uh, it means that uh, if the uh, United States need to respond quickly, effectively, to those contingency, possible contingencies, either in Taiwan or in North Korea, uh, U.S. forces in Japan must collaborate closely with U.S. forces in Korea. So that's why United States naturally need to pressure both Japanese and Korean governments to collaborate clear, closely if contingencies are coming much closer to us. So that's why I think now the Japanese government and the Korean government are willing to collaborate more closely, even in security policy areas. Very interesting. So these inter these international pressures will increase some sort of movement, um, political on the on the security front. That's that's for sure. I have many more questions, but actually we need to wind it down. Um, Professor uh, Hosoya, if people would like to follow your writing and your analysis, where can they find you? Yes, thank you very much. I am a research director in the think tank API, uh, Asia Pacific Initiative, and Fitch also has a economic security geoeconomic branch called Institute for Geoeconomics. And it has both API think tank and also uh, IOG have many, many uh, commentaries and uh, YouTube movies in English. So they can see uh, many, many uh, analysis and uh, a discussion relating to uh, like Japanese politics and the current international relations, mainly focusing on economic security and the economics. So this is one thing. And also, I am also a director at the KO University's Center for Strategy. And it also has many uh, YouTube movies as well as commentaries, both in English and uh, Japanese. So if uh, you are interested in uh, those things, please uh, check our website, both API, IOG, and also K KO Center for Strategy. I will link all of that in the description below. Professor Yuichi Hosoya, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh,